help me in welcoming Ed and giving us a talk about the hand. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you very much. And I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to be a part of this event. As you all know, this conference was conceived and brought to reality by two inspired individuals. And I'd like to propose that you join me right now in giving them a standing ovation for bringing us together. <laughs> happy, optimistic occupation that has given me a great deal of pleasure for very many years. I wish that I could spend my time here tonight talking to you along these lines, but I feel that I must talk about another direction that I see architectural education going in, and I think it would be more productive instead to talk about my fears of the teaching of building technology is in a perilous state and the technology teaching is endangered as never before from both within and without. From without, at virtually all the schools, we've seen the requirements for technical courses being whittled away at year after year after year and cut back to make way for new courses like architectural theory and social factors in design. I see building technology teachers under increasing pressure in many schools to bring in funded research and to pay as much of their own salaries as they can. More and more schools of architecture are now requiring a PhD as a minimum academic preparation for a faculty position in building technology. This is a policy that I believe will be detrimental to the teaching of building technology as I will discuss later. And from within, we are beset by dangers of our own making, ones that have also helped to bring on the external threats, and this is largely what I will talk about. I believe that nearly all students of architecture enter architecture school wanting to become broadly proficient in all the technical areas of architecture. They want to learn to design structures like Santiago Calatrava. They want to be able to do details and use materials like Renzo Piano does. And they'd like to design for energy efficiency like Malcolm Wells. But by the end of their first year of study at all too many schools, we've educated that desire out of them. And they, by the time they've been in school for a year, they realize the studio is where it's at. The studio is the all important part of architectural education. And that the technical courses are necessary evils that are to be endured in order to be able to continue to study design. The end result of this is that we have graduated generation after generation of students who are not broadly competent and whose design work suffers from a lack of understanding of the technical means by which we build. This is a disaster of major proportions for the built environment and a personal tragedy for thousands of individuals. Why does this happen? Well, in very simple terms, it happens because of the gap, not the clothing store the gap, but the gap, that huge bottomless gulf that exists in so many schools between the design studios and the technical courses. 
I believe that the gap exists largely because of differences in goals and language between the design studios and the technical courses. In the design studio, the goal is to create good form, and the language is of form and space and shape. In the technical courses, the goal is technical competence, and the language is math and science. In other words, we technical teachers don't have the same goal as the design studios in far too many schools, and we don't speak the same language. This often means that we communicate poorly, if at all, across the gap to those who teach the studios. Our students suffer because they get a disjointed education that fails to bring out the rich potential of building technology as an integral element of architectural design. Now, it's always fun to fix blame. Who's to blame for this situation? Well, let's be honest, a lot of studio teachers are technically incompetent. They show little concern for integrating technology into the studio. It would be easy to blame them for this gap. But then we have to ask, how did these studio teachers get to be this way? And the only plausible answer is that they got their negative attitude toward technology by taking technical courses from people like us. <laughs> so if we're looking for someone to blame, we only need to look in a mirror, because we, the technical teachers, are largely to blame for this gap. I hear complaints from architecture students at many schools around the country about many of their technical courses in all areas of building technology. In many schools of architecture, maybe the majority of them, students don't like a lot of the courses. They find them boring and irrelevant. We have very serious problems about what we teach and how we teach in building technology. I've given a lot of thought to this problem over a long period of time. That's the advantage of getting old. I don't think that this problem stems principally from a lack of teaching ability or a lack of good intentions. But I've concluded that most of the dangers that we face, both from within and without, are caused by our own lack of clarity about who we are and what we do. We've gone about our business for many years without stepping back to look objectively at what we're doing. We've been on automatic pilot as these storm clouds have been gathering. A host of important questions have come up and have gone unanswered. Some of these questions are, what is it that we teach this subject called building technology? What do technical courses have in common that makes them an identifiable area of the curriculum? Do we teach building science? Building engineering, building technology, what's the difference between these terms anyway? What is our purpose? Is it to furnish technical support to the design studios? Or perhaps to teach students what they need to know to pass the architectural registration examination? Or do we have a mission that is independent of either of these goals? All these questions can be summed up in one big important question. What is the essence of building technology? What is the essence of building technology? What is most essential to our teaching? This question becomes more and more important as we're yanked around in many new directions by building information modeling, computational fluid dynamics, multimedia teaching tools, web-based teaching, green architecture, design for the physically challenged, computer graphics, all kinds of computer algorithms and simulations, CNC machinery, 3D photorealistic modeling and rendering. These are all options that are opening up to us in very rapid order. And in order to evaluate all these options intelligently, we need to know what is the essence of building technology. We also need to know the answer to this question in order to know who we are, what our essential business is, and why it's important. By not knowing who we are, we've allowed others to step in and tell us what we should be doing, like cutting our curriculum requirements to the bone, conducting funded research, and pursuing PhD degrees that we may not really want in some cases. I think it's time that we learn who we are in order to take control of our own destiny. What is the essence of building technology? After much 
pondering of this question, I've concluded that it's not mathematics, it's not science, it's not engineering, it's certainly not preparation for the ARE. These things may play important roles in our teaching and building technology, but they're not the essence. For me, the essence of building technology, the concern that should be the primary focus of all of our courses, is getting the form right. Let me say that again. The essence of building technology is getting the form right. Get the form right and the rest is easy. Let me give you a number of examples that demonstrate why I believe this. I'll take these examples from every area of building technology in random order. Think about acoustics. What, sh what is the most effective, least expensive way to isolate a noisy space from a quiet space in the building? If we form the building in such a way that the two rooms are remote from one another, we solve the problem. If we insist on putting the noisy room next to the quiet room, we have a whole arsenal of techniques and and materials and assemblies that we can use to re reduce noise, tra noise transmission between the rooms, but it will cost the bundle and the result will never be as satisfactory as if we can simply put one room at one end of the complex and the other room at the other end. Make the, um, get the form right and the rest is easy. Still thinking about acoustics, think about designing a concert hall. The shape of the concert hall is virtually everything. Make the room a bad shape and you're faced with poor hearing conditions and increased expense for remediation. Get the form right and the rest is easy. Think about HVAC. If we want to make a building comfortable to inhabit and economical to heat and cool, it's virtually all a matter of formal decisions. We choose a sheltered place on the site. We choose the proper orientation for the building. We mass the building properly. We provide it with windows in the right proportions and in the right facades, in the right orientations. We use thermal insulation and thermal mass intelligently. We plant trees in the right locations. The math and the science become trivial if these formal decisions are made well. Get the form right and the rest is easy. Think about materials and methods of construction. Once again, getting the form right is important above all. Put movement joints where they're needed. Use rain screen configurations in the wall window details. Simplify the details to make them easier and more economical to build. All these are formal decisions. Get the form right and the rest is easy. Daylighting design is mainly about form. It's about window orientations, room proportions, positions and dimensions of reflecting surfaces such as light shelves, the reflective qualities of the surfaces in the rooms, distances of visual tasks from windows, make these formal decisions right and the rest is easy. And yes, the field of structures is mainly about getting the form right. Funicular form is the key to the creation of efficient, beautiful, long span structures. Proper material and system selection, good bay layouts, and good proportioning and shaping of members of the essence of creating building framing. And seismic design, the massing of the building is critical to prevent uh, torsional movements and things of that nature. The um, massing of the building is important so that we don't have building masses knocking against one another in earthquakes and hammering one another to smithereens. Lateral force resistance is largely a matter of putting shear walls and rigid joints and diagonal bracing in the proper locations. The mathematics of structures becomes almost trivial. It becomes virtually a matter of just verifying rule of thumb calculations that are extremely close to the truth once we got the form right. All of the very best structural engineers in modern times have warned against overemphasizing mathematics and structural design. The great Swiss engineer Christian Mann once wrote, quote, over the last 50 years, engineers have paid a great deal of attention to detailed and precise mathematical calculations, especially of stresses. We realize now that reinforcement concepts, construction methods, and details such as waterproofing, drainage, 
joints and bearings are even more important than accurate calculations. But as the tension shifts back and forth between calculations and construction, the one constant imperative is the need to give good form to structures. End of quote. My colleague and mentor, Václav Zaleski, has put this another way. He says, a structural designer who is preoccupied with mathematics is like a tennis player who watches the scoreboard and not the ball. Well, if structures is not so much about mathematics, is it science? The great engineer Wolf Arup once wrote, engineering is not science. Science studies particular events to find general laws. Engineering design makes use of these laws to solve particular problems. In this, it is more closely related to art or craft. And as in art, its problems are underdefined, there are many solutions, good, bad, and indifferent. This is a creative activity involving imagine, imagination, intuition, and deliberate choice. Well, many of you here as structure teachers think about your own courses. Do they involve Arab's imagination, intuition, and, and deliberate choice? What about men's reinforcement concepts, construction methods, and details? And did you notice men's emphasis on giving form to structures? In the traditional structure sequence that is still taught at far too many schools, we teach students to check beam and column sizes. But we don't teach them how to make a building frame out of those beams and columns, how to provide lateral load resistance to that frame, how to detail the structure, how to exploit the structure as a feature of the architecture. In other words, we don't teach students to do the things that the best architects have to know how to do. Instead, we teach them a non-functional subset of the mathematics that an engineer uses to check structural members. It makes no sense. What does make sense in all technical areas is to teach students to get the form right. Creating appropriate form is the essence of building technology. But too few of us have figured this out. Maybe we're driven by an obsolete definition of technology as having to do with math and science. But we tend to teach what is mathematical about our subject or what is scientific rather than what is essential. One area of building technology that has successfully bridged this gap is ECS, environmental control systems. And what happened there is if my magic is that decades ago, a few inspired and insightful individuals like Ralph Knowles at the University of Southern California, or um, Jeff Cook at Arizona State University, or John Reynolds at the University of Oregon, began to teach ECS in a totally new way. They replaced the dull, useless courses that had uh, concentrated on the sizing of pipes and ductwork with sparkling courses that concentrate on the relationship between building form, comfort, and energy flow. The students now find the field fascinating and relevant in many schools, and the ECS teachers have formed a wonderful organization, the Society of Building Science Educators, that perpetuates this method of teaching ECS. <clears throat> and you'll find as you look through the teaching materials that this organization makes available that the emphasis is universally on getting the form of the building right. Get the form right and the rest is easy. Curiously absent from our technical curricula at most schools is the subject of architectural detailing. Detailing is absolutely essential to the architect because it's our one means of translating our ideas into reality. When working with a team of professionals on a large project, detailing is the one technical area, the only technical area in which the architect is expected to be the expert. But only a handful of schools, to my knowledge, teach architectural detailing. We persist in teaching bits and pieces of other disciplines specialties, but we don't teach our own field of expertise detail. Go figure. <clears throat> As new tools and approaches become available to us, like building information modeling and CNC, computer numeric control, 
It would be unwise to hurry and to hurry to restructure our teaching around these latest things to come on the scene. Getting the form right is still priority number one. And by all means, we should teach these new areas, but we must not lose sight of the building of, of the essence of building technology as we do so. Now, to this point, I've been largely negative. A lot of fun being negative. I've been telling you what's wrong with much of our teaching, and now I'll shift to the positive, which is harder, and give you some ideas about how perhaps we can bridge the gap and how we can teach better than we do. I believe that the best way to teach the technology of architecture to students of architecture is to teach them how to use technology to get the forms of their buildings right. If they can get the forms right, the rest is easy. We should teach them to do this in the context of design problems, either big ones that are given in the studio or smaller ones that we give in our technical courses. This is project-based learning, and it has several advantages. Students like to design. They'll generally put more effort and care into an integrated technical design than they will into some isolated problem sets. Students learn that solving technical problems as a part of a design process can be fun and can contribute to the quality of the architecture, which is a very important message to get through. And information and techniques learned in the context of solving a design problem stick in the mind much longer and much better because the student knows why these subjects are important and because they're able immediately to implement this new learning into their design experience. Given the opportunity, students often turn on more interesting designs in their technical classes than they do in their primary studios. And some of you have had experiences with this, and these sometimes lead to conflicts with the traditional studio teachers. I've had the experience of a studio teacher coming to me and saying, you're overworking your students in your technical class and you're spending too much time on it and not enough time in the studio. And what I have to restrain myself in, from saying is, I don't give my students too much work. It's just that my students find the problems that I'm giving them much more interesting than the problems that you're giving them. And I think that some of you have had this problem as well. Ideally, I think we teach all of our technical courses in design studios, because the studio is set up to teach the making of good form through project-driven learning. Practically, we can do this some of the time at best. Because, um, but what we can do is to offer secondary studios, as I have done on a number of occasions, that are designed to concentrate on technical issues that carry fewer credits in the primary studios. Where we can bring the studio into the classroom, as Patrick Painting has done at Utah, among many others, with design-relevant teaching and creative exercises given as homework. My colleague Pat Rand at North Carolina State University has brought as his gift to this conference, to each of us, a marvelous paper, which I recommend to you highly. And in this paper he writes, quote, it is not enough just to teach technology through technology courses. We must try to teach architecture through them. If technology courses only address technical considerations, then we implicitly teach our students that there need be no connection between what a building is and how it is made, end of quote. Now I know some of you are thinking, good grief, I can't cover my subject area now in the time I have. How can I possibly add in design activity on top of everything else? Now I'm going to give you the best piece of advice you will have had for me tonight. Because I say to you, why try to cover your field? It's impossible. Every field of learning is far larger than what we can cover in the time that we have available to us. Furthermore, I've discovered that most of the technical skills that I learned when I was an undergraduate became obsolete with only a few years, within only a few years of graduation. For example, in the field of structures, every set of calculation techniques that I learned in school has been replaced by a different set of techniques since I've been in practice. The MIT teaching manual contains a wonderfully liberating piece of advice, and this is as good advice that I promise you. That is, don't try to cover your field, it's impossible. Instead, try to uncover a 
portion of the field and teach your students how to learn the rest of themselves. There's something you can do in a limited amount of time. And that hopefully will free up some time that you can spend teaching design in your technical class. Don't try to cover your field, uncover a portion of it, and teach your students to learn the rest for themselves. What will happen if we continue to go on as we've been doing and take none of these actions that I've suggested? What will become of technical teaching and architecture programs? One answer to that question is that what will happen to us is very likely to be similar to what has happened to many structural engineering and civil engineering programs across the U.S. and even outside of the U.S. These departments are in big trouble. They cannot attract enough majors anymore to justify their existence in the university. The enrollments are so low that departments are faced with extinction. Now we live in a golden age of structural design in my opinion. Dozens of wonderful, exciting structures are built each year all around the world. Yet the structural engineering curriculum has become so lifeless and dull that students simply won't sit still for it. How can this be? Well, I believe that it's largely the result of long-standing policies of most engineering schools to hire as teachers only people who hold PhDs. So what's wrong with that? Well, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with a PhD, and there's a lot of things right about it. It's an excellent credential for doing research and for teaching science and mathematics. And from the standpoint of a university administration, an all PhD faculty is the highest possible goal. It generates new knowledge through research. Not unimportantly, it generates grant money to support the university. And it sounds really first class to say that all of your professors have the highest academic degree. The flaw for architecture programs is that this requirement tends to select for teachers who have scientists and theoreticians and to bar entry to people who are primarily practitioners. Scientists, like the rest of us, can only teach what they know. What they know is theory, science, research, and mathematics. They can't teach what they don't know, which is design. And I've had occasion to observe some civil engineering professors trying to teach design. And believe me, it's not a pretty sight. <laughs> it may be a golden age of structural design, now, as I've said, but you wouldn't know it to sit in their classes. In this very exciting time, structural engineering professors have sucked all the life out of structural design and made it a dry, unattractive option. They teach only what is scientific and mathematical about structures. They teach nothing about getting the form right. Several years ago, I received a letter from a student at Swarthmore College who had seen my little book on structures. He was double majoring in structural engineering and studio art, and I want to quote from his letter. In the last four years, I've caught glimpses of how unbelievably interesting structural design can be, but have had very few first-hand experiences. The bridges of Calatrava, Men and Maillard make clear that creative decisions can be made in a structural design. But I've never had a professor who embraced those ideals. Last fall, I took a directed reading course in bridge design, but I got so bogged down in load and resistance factor design that it wasn't very enjoyable. Can you recommend any graduate programs in structural engineering that would teach the design of structures? Any ideas would be greatly appreciated. I don't know what you would have told this guy. I told him he had to go outside the country. I suggested that he go to Stuttgart and study with Jörg Schlein, or perhaps to Switzerland to the AKH, and he might do better there. I went to a conference a few years ago where a professor named Robert Warner from the University of Adelaide in Australia gave a paper, and he was very excited as he gave this presentation. He and his colleagues had instituted a curriculum in civil engineering in which every student takes a design studio in every semester of the curriculum, from the very start to the very end. And they are ecstatic with the results. To quote from his paper, experience shows that a sudden switch from analytic work to creative problem solving and design is always very difficult. And the later that change is made, the more difficult it is. Indeed, psychologists suggest that overemphasis on analytic thinking without adequate, <coughs> adequate early exposure to open-ended problem solving 
can be an impairment to the development of design skills. And alternative approaches to introduce design and open-ended problem solving at the start of the course of study. There are various advantages inherent in this approach. Firstly, it solves the motivation problem. Uh -huh. Also, creative thinking is introduced to students at the beginning of the university studies and not at the end. So the analytic and creative problem solving work can run throughout the course. End of quote. Warner goes on to mention the advantages of introducing analytical tools on what he calls a just-in-time basis, which means that lectures on analytical tools are given just when the students in the course of their design work realize the need for them. And there is no more powerful way to present work than that. He didn't explain in his paper where he finds teachers who are qualified to teach engineering design. I should add that I'm not aware of other engineering departments that have followed Warner's lead. But turning our attention from structural engineering departments to architecture departments, I believe that if we fail to take action now to improve our teaching and make it more design-oriented, our courses will continue to decline in acceptability to architecture students, and the gap between the studios and the technical courses will grow even wider. This brings me back to my argument that building technology is principally about getting the form right. Another name for getting the form right is design. All of us technical teachers are or should be design teachers who specialize in the design of the technical systems of buildings. This brings up what I think is the greatest danger of all to us, which is that hardly anybody knows what design is. To the general public, design is generally the application of window dressing to products that have somehow magically been conjured up through the miracle of science. Teachers in grades K through 12 think that design is the same as art. There are hardly any schools any place before architecture school that teach anything about the design process. Engineering is, or at least should be, a design discipline but most engineering teachers haven't a clue what design is. They teach math and science and call it design. To design a beam is to run the numbers on it and see if it's big enough. Nobody in the US government has ever realized that design excellence is in the national interest and should be a high national priority. It takes good designers of every kind to produce goods that would be competitive in world markets. Without this realization, we sit and watch our trade deficit pile up. Most damaging to us as technology teachers is that university administrators don't know what design is. They force us to function as scientists or artists to gain credit toward academic advancement. They don't recognize that design is one of the most exquisite of all human intellectual activities, or that it is of great importance to human society. You know who else doesn't know what design is? A lot of architecture teachers including technical teachers. They think that design is a process that can be applied only to the form and space of buildings, and that the technical systems are created through a boring process of applying science and mathematics to the problem. There are even a lot of technical teachers who believe this. This means that we have work to do not merely to teach our students what design is, but to teach everyone else in society what design is and why it's important to all of us. In doing so, we will eventually eradicate the external threats that I mentioned because people will understand what we do. We won't be burdened with the PhD. And we be can begin to do this by realizing that the essence of any technical field is not math and science. It's getting the form right. This brings us to a crucial realization Getting the form right is also what the traditional architectural studio is all about. This means that maybe, just possibly, we and the studio teachers should be able to share similar goals and speak the same language. It doesn't have to be the techies on one side of the gap talking math and science, and the touchy feelies on the other side talking about form and space and light. 
whole faculty could be on the same side talking about getting the form right. And the students will be much better designers if we can do that. This would mean that we can all work together to make our students better designers rather than working across purposes as we often do now. And this would mean that the quality of our new buildings, those that will be designed by our students, can get better and better in the years ahead. All of this will take time, but it can happen if we realize that building technology is not so much about math and science as it is about getting the form right. Get the form right, and the rest is easy. Thank you. Sadly, 
Mark Lesnar doesn't have architecture either, so it's an interesting uh, dilemma. But I don't know how pervasive this is in product design, uh, but, but apparently auto design, um, auto industry, and the aerospace industry is very interested in getting these interdisciplinary dynamics. So for what it's worth, I thought it was an interesting. Yeah, comment. that's encouraging. Where do we sign up? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds really good. Yeah. Well, the question, the question. It's got all these 3D modeling stuff and machines and things, mill things, and they have all that stuff, too. My questioner here, or the man who offered this information, is Joe Burns, who's a very creative engineer himself, a structural engineer. Joe, I want to ask you, where did you learn to design? Uh, well, I studied architecture first. I, I, went, to, uh. <laughs> I went to Notre Dame and, and I got back to architecture degree. And that went to MIT. And um, what I liked most about MIT, I went mean, dead there at the time, but what was amazing is I got admitted to the engineering school in the master's program, even though I didn't have an engineering degree. I had extra courses in engineering as an undergraduate. But um, That's something a lot of engineering schools do that they don't have to talk about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but I have a lot of the colleagues of mine that yeah. same thing. You know? But the architecture school is often official, well-advertised programs to do that. And a lot of engineering schools do it, but they don't have to. No, no. And, uh, so anyway, I did that. So I had the good fortune of learning design Architectural design, or design, however you want to call it. Um, it was my privilege a couple of years ago to have lunch with Anthony Hunt, who's a, one of the wonderful British uh, structural engineers and works with some of the high tech architects. And I asked him that question how did you learn to design? And he said, well, his first engineering job after he got out of engineering school was with a guy named Felix Samueli. Samueli? Yes. Uh, a great post-war British engineer, I, I would say. I've seen uh, bits of his work in photographs. It's quite wonderful. And Samuel Lee's office was in an old set of buildings in London. It was a set of small rooms. There was no single big room. And he was put in a room with four architects who worked for the firm. So he learned to draw and to design from the architects in that room. Yeah. Now you, well, you know, and then there's the, the, the apprenticeship. How do you learn design? That's a good question. How do the sort of the people that you look up to in uh, <coughs> the design world, at least in my world, the structural engineering world, and I've, had, I've really had the incredible fortune of working with people like Fazil Khan, Bill and Major, Charlie Thornton, um, even a guy named Dick Denser from Cleveland when I started out. And these are very creative engineers, and uh, you know, the, you don't. You can't learn it all in school, as you said. Uh, you said it very well. But you got to learn. Uh, I've never heard it put that way. But you know, you have to uncover it, and then you have to learn how to learn. And I continue to learn. I mean, I've been practicing for 30 years now. I learn new things every year. Carl, I was just thinking. You know, you, you ought to allow people to change the registration for me. Yeah. You know, to test what you need to know. To a surprising degree, that's happening already. It's quite remarkable the change in the structures exam, for example. A lot less emphasis on calculation and a lot more on making choice. And I, I think you're absolutely right. I think we've got to keep after that. I was going to make one remark uh, also about what I've often heard from engineering educators when I say you should be teaching these students to design things. They say, well, students can't be taught to, to design until they know the fundamentals. And fundamentals is a kind of a code word for mathematics until you can't stand it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and you notice that uh, Robert Warner was quoting research to the effect that it actually becomes an impediment to have had too much of the fundamentals, if you will. <laughs>